Uh, the three, two, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you from Rip Rocks in Denton, Texas. It's the Open Bar Review. It's corporate cow Paul Wedding. With me as always is Leopold Knopp. And returning is our guest, Rhiannon Sagert. And for this year's Halloween, we will be doing a special career retrospective to the famous late director, Wes Craven. Wes Craven was a primarily a horror director, uh, operated in five decades. Three of his biggest ones, which we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, each shifted horror as a genre on its axis. There was Last House on the Left in 1972, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984, and Scream in 1996. Every 12 years, this guy completely redefines <laughs> what horror movies are. Or at the very least, what slasher movies are. Last House on the Left, basically a Clockwork Orange has done like a slasher movie. Clockwork Orange made by an American <laughs> who doesn't necessarily care about all the framing. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a revenge exploitation film that saw a wider release. You start to see some things that are pretty kind of what I think of when I think of Wes Craven movies, you start to see uh, suburbia portrayed in like a very ironic or even like malicious light. Mm -hmm. um, you start to see the Nancy Thompson box of tricks. It's not yet me. Later Wes Craven movies almost get me. But as hokey as that movie is, it's not quite, it doesn't hate its characters. Um, that said, it's incredibly slow and kind of a slog to get through yeah. today. Mm -hmm. Which is weird because it's only, it's not even an hour and a half, but it just feels like every scene goes on forever. You almost get the sense that they've had to use like every bit of thing, like every bit of movie they shot had yeah. to go in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't say every bit of film, but definitely like everything in that script and nothing could be cut. We have to have these hokey cops and we have to have the chicken scene. <laughs> <laughs> There's like two, two to three minute shots of these guys just walking down a fucking road three cars that pass by and they can't convince them to pull out your fucking badges <laughs> and get her out of the car. Yeah. Like, you know what's going on. Um, that is kind of important. Uh, that's kind of another hallmark of Wes Craven is that authority is always inept and or not to be trusted. In Last House on the left, it gets kind of subverted at the end when the parents successfully murder the gang of murdering rapist Jews. Those, those good old boys. And lesbians. Up to no good. I wouldn't describe it as a clockwork orange with racist people. I would describe it as more like the Dukes of Hazard if they were weird rapists. Yeah. The antagonists are almost portrayed like they're younger and they're kind of doing like gross characters of rambunctious teen behavior mm -hmm. throughout the whole movie. It's almost like at the end the parents are in fact the uh, you know the vengeful stalker. Yeah. And it's another movie about badly behaved teens getting killed. But when we say badly behaved, we mean like actual psychotic criminals. What made this movie so significant? What was everybody imitating about this movie? Probably the the gratuitousness of the of the violence and the, the sexual violence. And then I definitely think that uh, that undercurrent of like you know sickly sweet suburbia. I could definitely yeah. see that coming out even today in some horror movies. You still see that. Nightmare on Elm Street kind of first like classic I guess slash film as we think of them today. Anyway. Um, well, there was Halloween in 1979. No, I mean out of West Craven. Freddy was a lot wider in that first movie, but definitely gave a lot more personality and made the murderer of a slasher film a lot more personable than, say, uh, Michael or Jason. A lot of horror movies at that time had a really, if not outright unlikable, just brainless cast of teens that you can wait to see die. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street's a little different because it's a smaller cast, especially in that first one, and they're all maybe not like, you know, they're not perfect beings, but they're definitely, they're smart. You don't want to see them get hurt. Uh, it's one of the few slasher movies where you're actively rooting for the teens to live. Not just for like your one purity girl to not die. Yeah. Where you have a main character who does things. Uh, yeah, uh, Nancy definitely has a lot more agency um, besides just being virginal, I guess, and mm -hmm. staying in after curfew. Well, Actually, not just... she does the opposite of that. <laughs> It's not necessarily that Nancy survives because she is pure. 
It's that she survives because she has a little more agency and actively fights back. Yeah. In a, Probably in a, because she's a bad. Yeah, fights back in an environment where the, all the adults are sticking their heads in the sand. And that's again where the fear or distrust of authority is like super important to those movies. If you follow the adult advice, you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think was uh, foundational about this movie? What, what did other people imitate? Unfortunately, what people tend to imitate is, as the movies go on, Freddy is more and more of like, you know, he's cracking dumber jokes, he's more wacky, I guess. Yeah. And you unfortunately see that in movies like the Leprechaun movies, <laughs> or God Help Me, Thanks Killing. Sure. Or, like, where the, <laughs> where the murderers kind of have this, like, wise-cracking Freddy Krueger thing going on. And, frankly, it wasn't that good when Freddy did it in most of those sequels. Like, sure. it was, and it only gets worse from there. Oh, yeah. So, it, kind of, it takes your slasher killer from a masked, silent threat to somebody with a little more personality. It gave us definitely, like, a more subconscious or, like, a slightly more involved take on a slasher movie. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's kind of psychological. Yeah, horror. it is somewhat psychological. And those would be the two main things I would say. So it's less of being an influential slasher and more of being just far and away the best one. Well, I never said that. I said Halloween. that. I have my arguments for Halloween being a contender. I would side with Halloween, personally. Oh, what? Maybe not the best, but definitely the most unique. Did Wes Craven do any of the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels? I'm, I'm not no, sure. I don't I, believe so. I don't think he did. No. There are like seven more Freddy Krueger movies, but the only one that he was involved in was uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which came out uh, 94? Uh, early 90s. Yeah, 94, I want to say. Early 90s. And this is where uh, we start to see Scream's DNA begin to emerge. But this movie was about... Heather Langenkamp, the actor who played Nancy Thompson in the first movie, uh, suddenly being haunted by Freddy Krueger. This, this bizarre combination of reality and fiction. All, slightly like, like a parody of the movie industry. New Nightmare, we start to see this sarcastic meta disillusionment with the film industry. Yeah. And not necessarily a, a mean treatment of it, but the, the fact that Wes Craven is, is clearly aware that, of the system that he's a part of. And so from there, we get Scream. Which is like a more fully fleshed out new nightmare with an entirely new character. There's this really hooky line in the It adaptation with Tim Curry, yeah. where the character Beverly is like trying to figure out why It is so evil, and she says something like, why does it hate? Why is it so mean? And that's how I feel about Scream, like, all the time. <laughs> it wasn't, like, a lovingly made parody, like, something like your next. It was made purely out of Wes Craven's just, like, like solidified anger and salt at what slasher movies had become by that time. And anger at the audience. Ang yeah, anger at the fans in a way that maybe I shouldn't take personally, but I so. kind of do. So j just to play devil's advocate here, do you not feel like that may have had some positive influence on the way that horror movies were made after it was released? Well, no. <laughs> no, because the, word, like, the yeah. most clear um, imitators I can think of are things like I Know What You Did Last Summer. That was the first thing that I thought of, yeah. That's the real irony of the Scream franchise is that they made it as sort of this, like, tombstone for the slasher genre. It was supposed to be the final nail in the coffin on yeah. slasher movies, and all it did was bring them back in a big way. Yeah, those really those really came back in the late 90s after Scream came out. Yeah, and... Scream 2 and 3, which Wes Craven was a part of, what, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, a Halloween H2O came out two years later. Man, man, we don't talk about the late Halloween movies. <laughs> That's when you get Freddy vs. Jason. That's when you yeah. start seeing those remakes start coming into production. Those came out in the late aughts. Yeah, that although nobody I will, really liked. Even at a Evil argue. Dead, Cabin in the Woods is arguably like a sort of like an, a more in depth scream, I would say. Yeah, Cabin in the Woods is like a really overdeveloped, like, new nightmare, or like, logical conclusion of new nightmare. Freddy vs. Jason is also definitely a parody, like, it's taking the piss out of those sure. two franchises, but it was made by people who like those movies, not a director who is, like, <laughs> up to here. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the irony. Yeah. Well, like you said, like, Wes Craven was trying to show people 
how stupid slasher movies are. And he's not he's not offering a solution. And he, he kept on making those kinds of movies after he made those movies. I, yeah, he, he kind of embraced the absurdity of mm-hmm. it. But instead, people took completely the opposite message and started making more slashers. I do like that when you finally see killers in that first movie unmasked, they are basically just like these like spineless, like shitty little piss ants. Once the mask comes off, you really recognize how just like gross they are. Yeah. That's kind of satisfying to watch them just yeah, devolve yeah. and the one guy starts like crying for Yeah, his they were both like, like wonderful like, villains, just like yes. spineless shitbags. So <laughs> Um, but to get to that, you have to get through so much just like mean spirited stuff. The other thing I like is uh, the character of Randy is far and away the most popular character for people who like the Scream series. Mm-hmm. Randy's the one who's kind of like the uh, socially awkward horror movie geek. Yeah. You couldn't imagine why people like that character. <laughs> I see him as almost like a not all horror fans. <laughs> what happened after that? I'd argue what happened after that was the Asian invasion of remakes and J horror yeah. movies. And, and then Paranormal Activity in 2007. Mm. Yeah. And now we're sort of we're sort of moving away from the slasher, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's becoming more focused on psychological horror and single protagonist type movies. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't agree that's a bad thing. That's what Wes would have wanted. For us to move away from slasher movies. <laughs> that's uh, that's us talking about Wes Craven. Uh, He's dead now. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, as always, Paul Wedding, Leon Up, Rhiannon Sagert, Rip Rocks, Wes Craven. Cheers. 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 Happy Halloween.